All right, Romans 13, we're still there, going to be at the end, then we'll move into 14. Uh, 13, 1 to 7, Paul, there he commands submission to secular rulers. And then in chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, he says that the, the one obligation or the one debt that we are to continually owe to one another is the debt or the obligation to love. So that's something that we're always trying to repay, but never repaying. We owe it to one another. And in loving one's neighbor, Paul says that one fulfills, uh, he fulfills the law because when you love somebody, in loving your neighbor, it means that you won't mistreat them. You won't sin against them. So he, he gives some examples so you won't commit adultery. You won't, won't murder. You won't steal. You won't covet. And he says other things like that. So that is how, that is how see, the, those commands of the Mosaic law are fulfilled in the Christian, in the one who loves. This is the law of Christ. That it's not that we have no moral obligations, that we simply free form. We have moral obligations, but those moral obligations are reflections of the center of Christian ethics, which is love. And so, yes, we can come and say, you know, uh, they're, they're, like I've said before, there are many, many commands in the New Testament. And they are ethical, moral commands, things we are obligated to do. It is because love has objective content. It's not simply this amorphous thing that we can make anything that we want. All right, in 13, 11 to 14, Paul says, And this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to be raised from sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night progressed and the day has drawn near. Let us therefore put off the works of darkness and let us put on the weapons of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in orgies and instances of drunkenness, not in episodes of illicit sexual intercourse and acts of licentiousness, not in discord and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus and do not make provision for the lusts of the flesh. So Paul says, look, now is no time to be lax in our discipleship because we're closer to the end, whatever that may be, than we were when we first believed. You see, each new day gives more reason to be diligent in discipleship, not less. Every day gives more reason to be diligent. It's like that game, I don't know how many of you have played this game with your kids or grandkids, Mr. Pop. You know, where you've got this guy, you decorate his face and you lean back and you wind it up and he, and then he winds up throwing the pieces at you. So it's like Mr. Pop when you can't see the timer, you know, since you know it's coming. You see, you know it's coming, so the longer you wait, the greater the sense of urgency. Right? It's like, uh, uh. All right, so that's the idea, you see, that Paul is talking about here. Verse 12, he says, the night progressed and the day has drawn near. That, that, that may be a phrase from a traditional baptismal liturgy where the one entering the faith, you know, he says, when we first believed, the one entering the faith was told that with Christ's coming and with Christ's ministry, the day of salvation had been brought near. In other words, it's it's a statement that Christ had, draw, had brought the consummation near. And this is, I've been through this many times with you. The day of salvation, meaning the consummated kingdom, was brought near in the ministry and the work of Jesus Christ. God's plan to secure the consummation, Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, that was the last event. That secured the consummation, and we from that point on are what? We're on the verge of it. You see, we live our lives with Christ, as James says, at the door. You see, he's at the door. I've shown you this uh, beautifully drawn diagram many times. I think the artistic talent of it alone is worth showing it to you. But you see, I should have had Joe do this for me. But you see, this is the idea. This is from, a, a, uh, I think it's a, a 19th century pastor, a guy named, uh, I didn't write his name, I think it's Newman. 
But it's just, I like it because it, it shows something of the idea, you see, that we are on the brink. We're on the brink of Christ's return, and that's where we live our lives. However long God and His purposes extends the time since Christ, He's ever at the door. Here's what John Stott says, Anthony's uh, favorite. Uh, John Stott says in his commentary, he says, What the apostles did know is that the kingdom of God came with Jesus, that the decisive salvation events which established it, his death, resurrection, exaltation, and gift of the Spirit, had already taken place, and that God had nothing on his calendar before the parousia, the return of Christ. It would be the next and the culminating event. So they, they were, and we are, living in the last days. We're on, you see, we're going on that, that parallel line, on the verge, right there. He's at the door. We live there. And we don't talk about that very much, and I think it's a mistake. That's where we live. He says, so, so, they, so they were, and we are, living in the last days. It is in this sense that Christ coming is coming soon, we must be watchful and alert because we do not know the time. And I think, see, Paul's point is, look, since the, the consummation is closer now than at any time in the past, we need to be uh, more than ever, we need to live in the light of that day. And that's why I talk about a lot when we talk about, you know, eschatology, that kind of thing. And, and we say, well, you know, that's like pie in the sky, who cares? No, it has it has tremendous ethical implications that's why Paul points to it and he says listen we need to live in light of that day more now than ever there's no place there's no place in the Christian life for things like sexual immorality or drunkenness strife and jealousy absolutely no place and that's what Paul sits here he says look we're closer now than ever we live on the brink of Christ's return. He says, let us walk properly as in the day, not in orgies, instances of drunkenness. That, that's just no place for that in a Christian's life. Not in these like, sexual immorality. None. Living with your boyfriend. No, 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 no. None of that. And I don't even, you know, it just strikes me that this could ever even be a thing. Like, well, what do we do with people? We tell them to quit. Amen. That's what we tell them to do. Because if you want to wear the name Christ, then you live in honor of Christ. And so, so he says, he's telling them, he says, look, this is how we are to live. You see, we're, we're to be this way. We are to become more like Jesus. We're to make no provision for lust of the flesh. This is to them, this is to us. No provision for lust. We are to be people who live to honor God, who live holy lives all over the Bible, old and new. That's how we are to be. That's the people that we're called to be. Now, the sad fact is that so many Christians fail to take this seriously. They really just fail to take this seriously. Ronald Sider, in his book, uh, in 2005, he published a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience. And I wanted to read you, I got four slides, I know it's a rather lengthy reading, but uh, bear with me on it. He says, once upon a time there was a great religion that over the centuries had spread all over the world, but in those lands where it had existed for the longest time, its adherents slowly grew complacent, lukewarm, and skeptical. Indeed, he's talking about the West. He says, indeed, many of the leaders of its oldest groups even publicly rejected some of the religion's most basic beliefs. And if you don't think that's true, you got, you got quote, Christian leaders saying all kinds of nonsense. Just plain, basic, clear heresy. And you have them saying these things. But he says, in response, a renewal movement emerged passionately championing the historic claims of the old religion and eagerly inviting unbelievers everywhere to embrace the ancient faith. Rejecting the skepticism of leaders who no longer believed in a God who works miracles, members of the renewal movement vigorously argued that their God not only had performed miraculous deeds in the past, but still miraculously transforms all who believe. Indeed, a radical, miraculous new birth 
that began a lifetime of sweeping moral renewal and transformation was at the center of their preaching. Over time, the renewal movement flourished to the point of becoming one of the most influential wings of the whole religion. He's talking about evangelicals. And he says, then the pollsters started conducting scientific polls of the general population. In spite of the renewal movement's proud claims to miraculous transformation, the polls showed that, their, that members of the movement divorced their spouses just as often as their secular neighbors. They beat their wives as often as their neighbors. They were almost as materialistic and even more racist than their pagan friends. The hardcore skeptics smiled in cynical amusement at this blatant hypocrisy. The general population was puzzled and disgusted. You can't read that, but puzzled and disgusted. Many of the renewal movement's leaders simply stepped up the tempo of their now enormously successful, highly sophisticated promotional programs. Others wept. You see this idea, I don't, let's just bring them in. Moral renewal, moral transformation, crucified living. Shh, you don't want to do that. People don't want to hear that. They simply want to come and shop and they want to sit here. All right, is that Christianity? No. No. Christianity is a call to come and die. Okay, a call to come and die. To live your life surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he says, this alas is roughly the situation of Western or at least American evangelicalism today. Scandalous behavior is rapidly destroying American Christianity. By their daily activity, most, quote, Christians regularly commit treason. With their mouths they claim that Jesus is Lord but with their actions, they demonstrate allegiance to money, sex, and self-fulfillment. Now, whether you want to quarrel with whether the situation is as dire as Cider paints it, and I know there are people that would, I think he has a point in that this idea that we can just, look, we, we don't want to talk about ethical obligation, holy living, those kinds of things, because people don't want to hear that. It makes them feel bad. Look, you have to hear it. You have to hear it, because God has called you to a crucified life, and we are to be those kinds of people. Now, does that mean you chew your fingernails? Must that be accompanied by some kind of legalistic burden? No. Because you and I know that as we pursue and strive and seek to live honestly before God, that his blood cleanses us from every failing. So we are at peace, but we don't trivialize the call to holy living. Okay? We cannot do that. So Paul calls them, he tells them, listen, uh, we, need to, we need to go ahead and, and be uh, the kinds of people that the Lord would have us be. Now, in this next section... Verses 14, chapter 14, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 13. This next chapter and a half, Paul is making a plea uh, for peace among the Jew and Gentile believers. And I want to remind you of what I said in the introduction about uh, the founding of the church and some of the, you know, what's going on here in the church. It was most likely founded, uh, some of you will remember this, but I know many of you won't. <laughs> I just know how it is. Was it Ken Fox one day? He had a class in there and he said something about, well, people remember like, uh, I don't know, like 2% of what you say. I'm going, I'm doomed. <laughs> so, but uh, the most likely scenario for the founding of the church in Rome is that Jews who were converted on the day of Pentecost, as you see in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, there in Jerusalem, that they brought their faith in Jesus back with them to home synagogue. So it has a Jewish beginning. They're converted there from Rome. They go back to Rome to their synagogues. And the faith then spread among Jews there in the synagogues and also among God-fearers, who, those who were Gentiles who were interested in Judaism and who at attended the synagogue but without becoming Jews. So you had the Jews there, and then you had these God-fearers who were interested. So we have the faith spreading there. And then by A.D. 57, when Paul writes the letter to the, to the church in Rome, the church was predominantly Gentile. 
And so you say, well, so what's happened here? It begins with Jews who'd heard the message at Pentecost. This is, this is likely, okay? You don't, uh, this, is, I think, makes the most sense of how it started. They go back here, and so what begins is essentially a Jewish phenomenon in Rome with some Gentiles brought in who were the God-fearers attending the synagogues. Well, what happens that by now the complexion of the church is predominantly Gentile? And most people think that that probably happened when Emperor Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome in 49. And so he gives, he gives Jews the boot, and he wouldn't distinguish between Jewish Christians and Jews who weren't Christians. He just says, you guys are getting out. And so he gives Jews the boot from Rome, and when he dies five years later in 54, they then return, whoever wanted to. So you have Jews then returning, and by that time, the complexion of the church had changed. Okay, because they were all gone, the Gentiles grew, not all of them come back, and so now you have a predominantly Gentile church there. Now the Old Testament, it of course, it prohibited Jews from eating certain kinds of meat. Okay, there's all kinds of regulations about that you can see in Leviticus 11, uh, Leviticus 20, verse 25, Deuteronomy 14, verses 3 through 21. So they were prohibited from eating certain kinds of meat, and they were prohibited from eating any meat that was not slaughtered in a certain way, that was not slaughtered so as to drain the blood from it. And you can see that, for example, you can see that in Leviticus 17, 10 to 16, 1926, Deuteronomy 12, 15 to 25. While only Nazarites and priests on duty were required to abstain from wine. And you can see that in a number of places. So they were restricted in the kind of meat they could eat. Only certain kinds of meat. They were restricted that they could only eat meat that had been slaughtered in a certain way. And then you have some that are, that are prevented from uh, taking wine or, or in, ingesting wine. Now, what happened was is that scrupulous Jews, you know, Jews who were careful, uh, who were very interested in this, scrupulous Jews, they sometimes would avoid all meat. When they were in an environment where they couldn't be sure of what kind of meat it was or how it had been prepared. So they would just take the safety move and they would say, well, in that case, I'm abstaining from all meat. Because it may be a kind of meat I'm not allowed to eat. It may have been either it's one of the kinds of prohibited meats, or perhaps it's something that had been you know, prepared or butchered improperly. And even wine was sometimes avoided out of fear that it had been tainted by idolatry, that somehow it had been used in some kind of sacrificial offering to a pagan god or something like that. Okay, but the conflict here in Rome seems to have centered on food, and holy days. That seems to be the, the essence of it. Now, uh, drinking may be mentioned in verse 17 because it's a natural concomitant of eating, that when you're eating, you're drinking something. So it may be mentioned there, and wine may be mentioned in verse 21, just as an extension of the principle that he enumerates there with regard to disagreement about food. But it looks like the main beef, or what's causing the tension here, has to do with food and with holy days. You can see that in verses 2 and 3, verse 6, verse 15, verse 20, verse 23. That looks like that's the focus of really the rub of what's going on. Now these dietary rules and these observance of the observance of holy days, especially the Sabbath. You see, these dietary rules and the observance of holy days were considered very important matters of Jewish faithfulness. These were very important. They were central to maintaining the unique and separate status of the Jewish people. You see, this was something that was emphasized, harped on, drilled in. That we don't do that. This is who we are. And so these were very important, distinctive things that separated them from their neighbors. It drew them together. These are very important things. And when Jews became Christians, it was often difficult for them to really internalize and to accept in their hearts that it was okay to eat things that they had long been taught were offensive to God and to accept that the prescribed holy days weren't really distinctively holy or sacred. 
That just, you know, they can hear the words, they understand what you're saying, but there's something deep within them that had trouble really internalizing that. And you can understand that when somebody's been raised that way, right? And it was also hard because they were, that was an important social link for them with their fellow Jews. And this tension shows up in many places in the New Testament. This tension with the Jews uh, shows up in many places. Some Jews, of course, they insisted that a person had to submit to them all of the Mosaic law. They insisted that, you know, in order to be saved, you had to do that. In all of its particulars, you had to become a Jew and submit to the Mosaic law to be saved. Those are the people we know as Judaizers. That's what we call them. You can see that, for example, in Acts 15, verse 1, and Acts 15, verse 5. These are the people known as Judaizers, those whom Paul so fiercely opposed in Galatians and in other places. You remember, Paul said, look, they're preaching a false gospel. If I, an angel from heaven, preached you another gospel, let him be eternally condemned. He's talking about those people. So you had some, this manifested among the Jews, some would say, listen, you've got to become a Jew and you've got to submit to all the law of Moses to be saved. But there were others like those in Rome. There were others among the Jews who continued to practice these ritual aspects of Judaism as a matter of personal conscience without making it a matter of salvation. You see, I know that that's who these people are in Rome because if they had been Judaizers, Paul wouldn't have told them, he wouldn't have pleaded for them to be understood and accepted. He'd have said to them, they're false teachers. You see? So that's not who these people are. There are people, though, who continue to practice these things uh, as, as matters of personal conscience. And so that's who Paul is talking about here. Now, even among that group, there was a tendency to think that those not following the Mosaic law You see, those not following the Mosaic law, that they were less faithful or less devoted to God. They weren't really, they didn't really get it. No, no, they're they're okay, they're okay. But there was this tendency to hold them, see, somewhat at a distance as being lesser. And we can never never think that would happen in the church. But there was this tendency there. Now, conversely, there was a tendency among those who didn't follow the law to look down on the law keepers as unenlightened and arrogant. You know, they're just, look at these people. They don't know, they're still hung up on this. Can't they understand? And look at them thinking, and you know, they're so righteous. You see, so you, you see how tension would develop in the community of faith. And that's what happened there. And as I say, Romans 14 Verse 1 through 15, verse 13, it's a plea for peace among the Jewish and Gentile elements of the church. Now, there were no doubt some Gentiles among the law keepers, okay, converts to Judaism. Uh, I don't doubt that. And there were no doubt some Jews among those who recognized their freedom from the law. But mainly and basically and essentially, it was Jews and Gentiles. Okay, that's what's going on. So Paul says in Romans 14, 1 to 12, But welcome the one who is weak in faith, though not for quarrels about opinions. One person has the faith to eat everything, but the one who is weak eats only vegetables. Let the one who eats not despise the one who does not eat, and let the one who does not eat not judge the one who eats, for God welcomed him. Who are you? Who are you who judge another's house slave? To his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. For one person judges one day in preference to another day, but another person judges every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who esteems the day esteems it to the Lord. The one who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And the one who abstains from eating abstains to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for himself, and none dies for himself. For whether we live, we live for the Lord. Whether we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might exercise lordship over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother? 
Or you too, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, to me every knee will bow and every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. Paul says in verse 1, Paul says, he tells the Gentile majority, the Gentile majority that they are to welcome or receive those who are weak in faith, meaning the Jewish Christian who is weak in his grasp of the implications of the Christian faith, who has underdeveloped convictions about what the Christian faith allows. You see, they have those underdeveloped convictions, and he tells the Gentiles, you are to welcome them or receive them. And these weak Christians, he says, look, they are not merely to be tolerated, but are to be accepted into the fellowship of the family of God. They're not to be mocked. They're not to be called pinheads. They're not to be disparaged for their convictions, laughed at, any of that stuff. You see, because that would make them feel like outsiders and not truly part of the community. You, If we're all over here ostracizing them, well, then you haven't really received them. And so Paul tells the Gentile no, 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 you are to receive them. Moreover, he says that they're to be accepted with the right motivation and they're to be accepted with the right spirit. They're not to be received, you know, received provisionally. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm going to just let you in, okay, provisionally for the purpose of quarreling with them about their misguided convictions. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, bring them in here and then we can jump them. That's really all we're trying to do. We're not really interested in receiving you. What we're interested in doing is bringing you within our tongues so we can then jump on you and quarrel with you about your stupid beliefs. He says that they're not to do it that way. Now, that doesn't mean that teaching them is forbidden. Paul is teaching right here. It doesn't mean that teaching them is forbidden. It means that they're not to be received with an ulterior motive of setting them straight. They are to be received into the family of God as brothers and sisters. And then he says in verses 2 to 4 that those whose faith is strong enough to eat meat... They're not to have a disdainful or a condescending attitude toward the law-observing Jewish minority. That's not how they're, they're not to look down their nose at them. They're not to have this disdainful, condescending attitude like, listen, we're the enlightened people. We understand what's going on. You're a moron, and you can sit here at my feet, maybe. It's not to be that way. It is not, it is not to be that way, Paul tells him. They're not to have that, but then he said, look, neither is the Jewish minority to judge those who eat meat. You see, neither are they, so he tells the Gentiles, you're not to have this condescending attitude toward them, but he tells the Jewish minority, neither are you to judge those who eat meat, meat, because God has welcomed them, or he has received them, and since God accepts meat eaters, then so must the Jewish Christians. Right? Paul says, look, God receives them. He accepts them. I'm telling you that. So who in the world are you not to? So he wants to make sure that they don't sit there and say, okay, that's right. Okay, Paul's with us. Paul's with us. Says, no, no. What I'm telling them is they receive you, not with ulterior motives, and not to disparage you, and not to have a condescending, but they receive you as brothers and sisters, and you don't judge them because they have the understanding that allows them to eat. He says, look, after all, it's the Lord's judgment of his servant that matters. That's the judgment that counts. It's the Lord's judgment that matters, and the meat eater will stand in the Lord's approval. So Jewish Christian who has these, you know, who has these underdeveloped convictions that will not allow him to eat meat, You better not be condemning them because he stands in the Lord's approval and you then find yourself on the other side of God. So he tells them that. And then as I've said, Jewish and Gentile Christians, they differed in the observance of holy days and the eating of meat. And then in verses 5 and 6, Paul notes that the, the scrupulous Jew, this person who's observant, 
that this person, he, he observed certain days, especially the Sabbath. You see, that was a clear, that was a really big note. But he observed this, especially the Sabbath, as a distinctively holy day, whereas the Gentiles, believers, they considered all days equal in holiness. But the Jews, see, he had this sacred, holy Sabbath day. And he says, but the Gentile believers, they considered all the days equal in holiness. The scrupulous Jew also considered it wrong, or at least he considered it inferior or less pious. He considered it wrong or inferior or less pious to eat meat or to drink wine that may have been ritually unclean. Now, Paul says that either practice, either practice is acceptable as long as it is done with a clear conscience. Okay, either practice. Now, the practices of both the strong and the weak are acceptable to God. Now, listen, because neither is sinful. They are acceptable to God because neither is sinful. The one who observes holy days and who abstains from meat and wine because he erroneously but sincerely believes it's God's will to do so is doing more than the Lord requires in restricting his freedom. He's not sinning. He's doing more than the Lord requires in restricting his freedom. The one who correctly understands that the ritual or ceremonial aspects of the laws or law is not binding on Christians, he's enjoying his freedom in the Lord. It's like circumcision. You see, it's like circumcision. One is free to do it, but it's not sinful not to do it. That's an important distinction. You see, when something is sinful, when something is contrary to the will of God, it doesn't become acceptable just because the one doing it believes it's not sinful. You see, sin is objective. If this is sinful conduct, the fact you want to sit there and say, no, it's not sinful conduct. Well, it's, well, what do you believe it is? If it's sinful, it's sinful. You see. So Paul is sitting here, what he's saying, they're, they're acceptable because neither of them, neither of them are sinful. You see, some in Corinth, you can see this clearly, some in Corinth, you had them, they justified the eating of sacrificial food at the cultic meals in pagan temples. They argued with Paul that what we're doing is right. Because everybody knows that there's nothing, there's only one God, so there's no God that we're going to in these pagan temples. Right? So therefore, since we're convinced that it's okay, it's okay. Paul says nonsense. Paul says absolute nonsense. You see, they, even when they're pressing for the right arguing, saying we're right about this, Paul would have none of it. And you see that in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 13. Especially look at with chapter 10, verses 14 to 22. See, it's only when something is a matter of indifference to God that one's conscience is the controlling guide. It is when there's something, because if something's a matter of indifference to God and I think it's wrong, I'm not doing it. Why? Why shouldn't I do When I think it's wrong, even though God says it's not, but I feel it is wrong, you honor your conscience because in doing that you honor God. If I really believe what I'm doing is going against God, even though it's not, but if I believe it is and I do it, what does that say about my submission and love for God? It says that my love of this thing is more important. That's not the way to go. Okay? You honor your conscience. Of course, the scrupulous Jew believes at some level this is a matter of God's will. That's why his conscience is bothered. Whether the person would articulate it and say, no, I really think this is wrong, there's something going on deep in their heart based on their upbringing that there's something not right about this, and that's why their conscience is disturbed by it. In, in this case, you see, we happen to know that the scrupulous Jew is wrong. See, we know for a fact in this case that the scrupulous Jew is wrong because Paul tells us he's wrong. He tells us he's wrong both, he does says it implicitly by the fact he labels Jews weak in the faith, 
and he leaves the matter as a matter of conscience. So that's telling us that it's wrong. And he does it explicitly in verse 14 and in verse 20. So here in this case, we know that the scrupulous Jew does in fact have underdeveloped convictions about what the faith allows. Now there are a couple of facts worth noting that I think will help us think clearly about this in terms of current disputes among Christians. The first is that we do not have an apostle or an inspired interpreter to answer definitively for us whether a disputed matter of personal conduct is in fact a matter of indifference to God. You see, for the Christians in Rome, the question for the Christians in Rome, the key for them was how would they treat one another in light of the fact revealed by the Spirit through Paul that consuming ritually contaminated meat and wine was a matter of indifference to God. Now, given that fact... How will you treat one another? For us, the issue often is how to treat one another in light of an unresolved dispute, whether the conduct is a matter of indifference to God. So you see, there's a conceptual difference there. They have clearly from the Spirit of God, this is a matter of indifference to God. We oftentimes don't have that. That's the very point in dispute. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And second, Paul is here addressing matters of personal conduct. Eating meat, drinking wine, esteeming certain days, not corporate worship practices. And though though what he says here, and especially what he says uh, following, in, in, in chapter 14 particularly, it has significant implications for respecting another's conscience in corporate worship. There's a difference between personal conduct and corporate worship. You have to recognize that. One who fails to persuade a brother that some aspect of his personal conduct is contrary to the will of God, he has no concern that he's tied to or is a participant in that brother's conduct. See, his question, I heard that bell, his question is whether he should continue to receive that person as a brother despite their disagreement. Okay, that's one thing. But corporate worship, you see, that is a communal enterprise. Corporate worship is a communal enterprise. It's something offered to God as a whole. By a unified body of believers, it is not the separate offerings of individuals who happen to be occupying the same space. That's Western individualism gone crazy. You see, it is something that we as a body, as a people, as a community, offer up to God. It's congregational, not individual. So we all share, you see, in what the congregation accepts or willingly practices in its worship. It is our worship. It is our worship. If half the congregation strums guitars or blows police whistles, those not engaging in that conduct, they're implicated in it in a way that wouldn't be true if that same conduct was done personally or privately. It is in the nature of worship as a body of believers. That is why worship is always such a flashpoint. You know, Terry was talking about on Wednesday, these things are always issues. That's why. That's why, in fact, as uh, uh, Howard Norton, one of the, I think, uh, wise men in the Church of Christ, he wrote now over 20 years ago in the Christian Chronicle, Norton said, the public worship assembly is critical to our unity as a brotherhood. It always has been. Because of this, we must be exceedingly careful when we tamper with it in any way. We are very resilient in churches of Christ when the issues on which we disagree fall outside the public assembly of the saints. When controversial practices enter the public assembly, however, everyone is affected and the possibility for division and shattering is scary. That is certainly the truth and that has happened repeatedly, you see. Now, you wind up saying, okay, well then, then, all right, well then we can't, uh, we can't have communion before. He's not talking about that. You see, we can't have a moment of silence. No, he's not talking about that. 
He's talking about introducing different things in the, in the, the elements of worship, you see, that wind up distressing people. And as I say, what Paul says here and in 14 has a great deal to say about respecting another's conscience. But I just see that's why when you say, well, what is it? Why do the people talk everywhere? Not just in churches of Christ. Why do people talk everywhere about worship wars? The reason they talk about worship wars is this communal aspect of worship. You see, that's why. And so people are implicated in it. And so we want to be as a group of people united in what we're doing. Okay, so that's one of the things that I think is important to see here and what's going on. Now, so what about disagreements uh, today over Christian ethics? Okay, outside of these, what about these disagreements over Christian ethics? How are we to treat one another when we disagree over whether certain personal conduct is acceptable to God, given that there's no apostle to tell us clearly, you know, definitively, that this is a matter of indifference to God? How are we to proceed in that case? I mean, uh, there's no easy answer. Yeah, and that's just the way life is. <laughs> There's no easy answer, and there are difficult cases, but the end of verse 3, it seems crucial to me. He says, for God welcomed or received him. Now, that says to me, and this is my take on that, that before we can rightly refuse to accept a brother for engaging in conduct that he contends is acceptable to God, we have to conclude that that conduct is condemned with sufficient clarity to warrant the presumption that engaging in it is a denial of Christ's lordship. Just think about this, okay? The question, it seems to me, is not whether I'm personally convinced that something there is wrong, but whether I'm convinced that a reasonable or good faith handling of Scripture demands my conclusion. I've played around with the Bible long enough to know that people look at things differently and that there are arguments that have to be weighed. You see, they ha things have to be weighed. Okay, so if I'm sitting here saying, I'm convinced this is right because as I put the pieces together, I heard the bell. I, 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 you know, I think that, okay, no, I'm convinced this is the truth. But I can recognize that, yeah, I see that. I see that that kind of does that. All right, so I'm talking about in one of those kinds of situations. So we run into those all the time, you know, about playing cards, dancing, uh, social drinking, all these kinds of things. Are they in the same category as homosexual conduct? No. Okay, in terms of clarity, in terms of what the Bible says? All right, so these things have to be worked out. But one I put in one case where we can have disagreements about things, and I think as Norton says, we've been really good about that, actually, I think, in Churches of Christ. I really do think we've been very good about tolerating disagreements among those kinds of things. The flashpoint in our brotherhood and elsewhere has been when we introduced these things into fellowship. I heard the bell. Thanks for hanging on. All right.